Hello, and welcome to those of you who are first joining us, and welcome back to those who joined us earlier this morning. My name is Jennifer Olyle from Acutus Medical, and I will be your host today. As you can see, we have a full schedule for the next couple days. For details on all our events, please be sure to register and see our details at our website at acutusevents.com. During this session today, we'll review a couple case studies highlighting the value of the Acutus product portfolio for physicians and patients. We'll get a good look at how Acumap utilization can change workflow for physicians during their ablation procedures. And lastly, we'll introduce you to and take a closer look at our family of transeptal access products. Before we begin our session, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. All lines are muted to eliminate background noise. If you'd like to ask a question to the session moderator or presenter, please be sure to type your question in the Zoom chat box. Please feel free to ask your question at any time during this session. We'll have time reserved after each session for question and answer. Now, during this first portion of this session, Dr. Graydon Beatty will present an Acumap case study. Dr. Beatty is our Chief Technology Officer here at Acutus Medical. Following his presentation, Dr. Timothy Betts from the John Ratcliffe uh, Hospital in the Oxford United Kingdom will be joining Dr. Beatty for an engaging discussion and question and answer. Dr. Beatty will be presenting on a patient with longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation. This patient also experienced intermittent episodes of multiple morphologies of atrial tachycardia. Both left and right atria were investigated during this procedure and data rich series of maps were generated that documented the patient's atrial substrates and led to a clearly defined treatment and endpoint. Let's go ahead and take a listen. I will present a case report on behalf of Dr. Tim Betts and Dr. Mike Pope from Oxford, UK, of a patient who is treated as a live demonstration at the 2020 AF Symposium. The patient was in early 60s with long-standing persistent AF for at least 18 years. The patient was treated medically until symptoms indicated the patient for ablation about three years ago. The first procedure was PVI plus a roof line. The second procedure was in January with Acumap. The patient presented in sinus rhythm and substrate characterization was performed using all MAP rhythms. Sustained right atrial flutter, non-sustained AF, and non-sustained left atrial atypical flutter were induced and mapped. The CTI was treated with ablation and bidirectional conduction block was confirmed. In all, 11 maps of 8 unique rhythms were made within one hour. The MAP-REMAP workflow of Acumap enables rapid characterization of complex substrates. I will present five left atrial maps that were generated within the first 20 minutes of the procedure to characterize the left atrial substrate. The first map is a single position map of baseline sinus bradycardia with the Acumap catheter generally centered within the chamber. In the AP view on the left, we see breakout from the expected region of Bachmann's bundle, and then we immediately recognize an anterior zone with dramatic deceleration and pivoting conduction between and across apparent compartments of preferential conduction. Manually marking boundaries of maximum delay makes this preferentiality obvious. We also see that the site of late activation occurs on the lateral aspect of this zone. Questions that naturally arise are, is this pattern of conduction primarily due to transmural boundaries, or dissociated layers with limited sites of breakthrough, or some combination? Meanwhile, we see a broad sweep of coordinated conduction up the posterior and lateral walls in the PA view on the right, suggesting block on the roof line that was ablated in the first procedure. The second map is a supermap of left atrial appendage pacing, during which the Acumap catheter was hovered around the chamber for about 90 seconds while recording, followed by an automated algorithm that time-aligned the non-contact data into separate map bins associated with one or more morphologies that occurred during the maneuver. Now the conduction pattern sweeps more broadly across the anterior zone. 
When we add the marked boundaries defined in sinus rhythm, we see deceleration of conduction along the same anterior locations, although less dramatic. It appears that conduction approaching from a lateral location has broader access to the zone, perhaps along preferential fiber orientation distributed throughout the zone or across a layer. Meanwhile, we see a broad sweep of coordinated conduction down the lateral wall and up the posterior wall, again suggesting block on the roof line. The third map is a supermap of sustained right atrial flutter. Now we see breakthrough from the proximal coronary sinus with simultaneous conduction sweeping up the septum, roof, posterior, and lateral walls that culminates in late collision at the Coumadin ridge and left superior antrum. When we again add the marked boundaries, we see moderate deceleration along the same anterior locations. The fourth map is a supermap of non-sustained atypical left atrial flutter. We see a very complex pattern from the global perspective. If we focus on the lateral wall in the LPO view on the right, we see a short radius loop of reentry below the left inferior antrum. We also see that conduction splits off the loop, progressing superiorly on the posterior wall and medially under the inferior aspect. Meanwhile, a wave also progresses down the Coumadin ridge that appears to synchronously fuse with the lateral reentry loop. This is consistent with the distal to proximal progression shown in the LEO view on the left. To achieve a more complete understanding of this arrhythmia, we rotate the LPO view on the right cranially until centered on the left antra and change the left view to AP. Adding the previously marked boundaries facilitates identification of the second loop that appears to be synchronized with the lateral loop. Conduction proceeds from the anteroceptal aspect into the anterior zone following a serpentine path and then progresses down the Coumadin ridge to fuse with the lateral loop. Although this complex conduction pattern is compelling, we would need to successfully entrain the circuits by pacing at key locations to differentiate double loop synchrony from passive collision in a parallel path. It was not possible to investigate the circuits as the arrhythmia was non-sustained. The fifth map is a single position map of AF during several seconds of adenosine-induced AD block. Now we immediately see complex LIA type conduction on the anterior wall. When we again add the marked boundaries, we see dramatic deceleration across and pivoting around the same apparent compartments of conduction. We also see, for the first time, a zone of LIA-type conduction with occasional rotation on the posterior wall extending between the left and right inferior antra. Manually marking boundaries of deceleration and rotation based on the AF record alone reveals the cores of these zones of complex conduction. The anterior cores correlate with the marked boundaries of deceleration consistently observed in all the regular rhythms. A common ablation strategy for AF when guided by Acumap is to ablate core zones that are consistently associated with zones of deceleration across all or most mapped rhythms. Cores are often also anchored to the nearest non-conducting boundary if conditions in the surrounding region appear to pose the risk of re-entry around them after ablation. In this case, the anterior cores could be selected for ablation. However, the left atrial arrhythmias were non-sustained and deemed not clinically relevant at the time of the procedure. Nonetheless, the patient will be followed in the context of this documented substrate characterization. So thank you everyone for joining. This is now open for Q&A. Uh, one comment that I would just like to make at the outset about this particular case example, it's exemplary of many that I have witnessed myself and the, our team has been developing. The notion of having a rapid workflow on substrate characterization. In the early days, we would look only at the conduction pattern of AF, a means that was not available previously. 
So there was always just a certain amount of leap of faith. It would vary from, from operator to operator, the, the, the degree to which there'd be some leap of faith. But these conduction patterns that we've not been able to see before required some level of faith that this was a critical target to ablate. And of course, in our uncover study and other work we've done, we've certainly shown that those are relevant targets. However, when you add substrate characterization to this with a workflow that's very rapid, the guesswork and the leap of faith comes completely off the table. Here we have controlled rhythms that we understand completely that show zones of deceleration. And when those zones of deceleration uh, are consistently conforming from rhythm to rhythm, including the AF pattern, we end up with a very strong confidence that this is a fixed zone of conduction anisotropy that indeed plays a role in maintaining the AF and becomes an actionable target. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tim Betts to, with further comment and open up to questions. Thank you, Great. And yeah, that case sticks in my mind, not only because um, it was done as a live case for the AFIB symposium in, in January, and of course you go into that, hopefully having planned everything to the last, the you know, finest detail, and then the patient turned up in a different rhythm than we had seen him in clinic, and then he went under general anesthesia, he went into sinus rhythm. And that, we were just about to go live. And I could not imagine how well the case would actually turn out as a demonstration. We had uh, every rhythm disturbance under the sun, flutters, uh, atrial fibrillation, and I think you highlighted some of those. For me, the key take home message was how quickly we were able to assess all of these arrhythmias, do the maps, I mean, even creating the left and right atrial geometries took no longer than three or four minutes per chamber to create a geometry. Then each map took anywhere between 90 seconds and three minutes. Some of the arrhythmias, for example, the left atrial flutter, which we saw, only lasted for 60 seconds or so before degenerating into atrial fibrillation. With a conventional mapping system, there's no way one could have mapped that you'd have just seen a distal to proximal activation pattern in the coronary sinus and made an assumption that it was a perimitral flutter, which uh, and turned out to be a lot more complicated. So I think it was a fascinating and, and for me, very rewarding case to see how quickly we could not only move through the different arrhythmias, but also use the system to assess conduction block in the line from the initial ablation three years earlier, the left atrial roof, as well as when we did the right atrial cavotricuspidismus line um, that, uh, uh, that showed, showed conduction block nicely there. And, um, uh, yeah, and Dr. Can... Betts, there's a great question that has been posed. Um, in, the, in the face of seeing multiple regions of slow conduction in the left atrium, the question is, how would the ablation strategy be determined? So that is key, strategy. So, up until recently, people have really, myself included, we've often gone into the, these cases with a very predetermined fixed approach to what we're going to do. We're going to do pulmonary vein isolation, and then we tend to have our own favorite strategy of the day for dealing with persistent AFib. Obviously, if there's an organized clinical arrhythmia, we try to painstakingly map that arrhythmia and ablate it to sinus rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, it's a lot more challenging. Are you a linear lesion person? Do you do roof and mitral isthmus? Are you a posterior wall box isolation person? Are you a cafe mapping and ablation person? And to me, there, there never really seems to be, uh, well, we know there is no one strategy which is better than another. What we actually need to do is individualize our ablation strategy, our ablation lesion set, to each individual patient. And to do that, we have to map the patient and begin to understand the mechanisms behind that individual's fibrillation. So how do I do that as a workflow? Because of course, every patient is different. And actually the sinus rhythm information we may get at the beginning of the procedure because the patient comes into the lab in sinus rhythm may be useful because it gives an indication of what's going on in the atrial substrate. 
are there multiple zones of slow conduction and isotropy scarring or does sinus rhythm con and pacing does it conduct with the atrium in a very rapid and healthy manner because that might influence the decision to go beyond pulmonary vein isolation or not um, and also of course mapping the atrial fibrillation i mean my personal workflow if someone comes into the lab in atrial fibrillation i'll always map at the beginning even if it's a first time de novo case it gives the uh, technician something to look at while I then go on and do my pulmonary vein isolation, which is still the cornerstone of your first time fibrillation and re-isolation when you come back. But while they're analyzing the maps, which we've made of atrial fibrillation, and I'm doing my PVI, I can adjust my PVI to take in areas close to the antra, which we feel are key, um, or we can go back and map again afterwards. And then the decision as to what we do after PVI, I think should be map based and it should be based upon doing multiple maps. What we do is we look for consistency of what we think is driving and maintaining the AFib seen in multiple recordings, which of course you can do again and again very, very quickly. And some of the data we've gathered over the years and we presented at HRS last year shows that Perhaps the phenomena we initially thought were important, rotational activity, rotors, focal firing, they really are not that consistent in most patients. We see them, but spatially they move around. Whereas that lovely example you saw on the anterior wall of slowing and twisting and turning, that region, when you get a region of slow and irregular activation, that is consistent between every recording. And I think that if you're going to use a therapy which relies on treating an area which is stationary, you need to be treating a phenomenon which is stationary and not moving around. And I think these areas of irregular activation uh, are really becoming the focus of my strategy. But I also tend to have a minimalist approach if I can as well. I don't want to napalm the atrium. I want to treat the minimal area that is required to prevent further arrhythmias. That's so excellent in articulating what, what I can add from the standpoint of our collective experience, uh, being involved in a lot of the procedures directly. There is a coalescence that we are seeing toward what Dr. Betts has very well articulated um, the notion of consistency of the anisotropic conduction across various rhythm patterns, rhythm types, and then also the continuousness, if there is such a word, the, the continuity, the temporal continuity of that localized irregular zone that remains active so continuously, in addition to being a consistently placed location among the different conduction patterns. We have been generally coalescing toward prioritizing that targetable zone first. Since we can map and remap and ablate and remap very quickly, we can even break that down into a series of steps to break down the complexity of AF in a stepwise fashion, but to be able to do that with a very efficient workflow remap and see what was the effect of ablating the core and possibly tying that to a non-conducting boundary. And if we see a zone where it shows up in one rhythm, but um, is appearing perhaps to be functional because it doesn't show up in the other rhythms, we would then definitely lower the priority on that and we can map and remap and further assess on a patient by patient basis. Tim, back to you. No, I think that's very right. I mean, trying to determine the hierarchy of, of in which you're going to address different areas within the atrium. Consistency, uh, areas which are repeatedly present in either sections of recording. So the way it would work, I would typically do a 60 second recording, um, but we would analyze know, five, 10 second segments. But within that recording, we would analyze one at the beginning and then look at another one at the end. I, I also like to do an additional uh, recording then using adenosine to get rid of all the far field ventricle QRS complexes 
And we found it doesn't seem to change the uh, electrophysiological substrate that much, as you, not as much as you might imagine with adenosine. You certainly don't seem to get more focal firing, uh, things along those lines. Um, and then I guess that's, there's a science to this, but there's also an, an art and we're still learning uh, where do you go. And you also need to know when to stop if you felt you've dealt with the principal phenomena in the left atrium. You know, there are two atria. And more and more now, I will have a look in the right atrium if I've done you know, a reasonable amount of ablation in the left and the patient is still fibrillating. Sometimes you get a bit of an idea of which chamber might be driving the other, looking at sort of global cycle lengths. But it's actually quite easy to pull a catheter back, do a geometry of the right atrium, map the right atrial, atrium in atrial fibrillation, and have a look at that and target areas. And it doesn't stop you then pushing the catheter back into the left atrium if you need to remap the left atrium. Dr. Beatty oh. and Dr. Betts, it appears that we have a question from the chat room, if you wouldn't mind. What sure. is the average total area on the H on atrium? What is, an, what is the maximal area ablation can be applied? And will ablated area become conductive autonomously? Well, I, if you're talking about, does this approach lead to a lot of ablation, extensive ablation, only a little bit of ablation, some of that is very operator dependent. For me, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm glad the days of indiscriminate cafe ablation are way behind me. Um, you know, six, seven years ago, when it was a lot more fashionable, extensive ablation using very uh, basic algorithms determining what a cafe was and what wasn't, uh, you could end up with a, a huge area of patchy burning, which of course we all know is a fantastic substrate for further arrhythmias. I think here, we're using the uh, Acumap system, it's much more targeted. We tr it's focused on areas which we feel are consistent drivers, and if it's appropriate, they may be tagged, they may be joined up with a, an area like the pulmonary veins or the mitral annulus to prevent some local re-entry. So I believe that you do less ablation with this technology than you might with other strategies, um, less destruction. Will the ablated area become pro-arrhythmic? Well, that's got many other factors. That's down to your ablation cap, the contact force, the power, um, how much ablation you choose to do in that spot to you know, eliminate uh, all the electrograms, whether you choose to join it up with an adjacent uh, mm -hmm. non-conducting area. So I think that's less related to the technology uh, of mapping and more related to how you deliver the ablation therapy. And these are these are certainly aspects that we're learning. Um, before we're we're about to run out of time, and before we segue to the next uh, presentation, there was one other question that deserves a, a quick answer, which is: Do we see trends or themes to these target zones? Generally speaking, the answer is yes. We'll see more targets, sort of septal, anterior, and posterior. Very few lateral. Um, we, we do see, but they're just very rare. So while there indeed is a theme to that, they are also highly patient specific. Any consecutive series of patients will have um, the theme of anterior and posterior, but in one patient, there will be three that are two centimeters this way or that way. And in another patient, there will be two in, in, diff in, in separate locations, but generally in these areas. So it is both thematic and also highly individualized. Great, thank you both Dr. Beatty and Dr. Betts. Now let's, let's switch gears. Let's take a look at the technology spotlight on Supermap along with another case study uh, from one of our early adopters here in the United States. Let's hear how he's been adapting his workflow based on his, his experience with the Acumap system. Supermap is Acutus's approach to taking the challenges in mapping repetitive rhythms um, and taking everything we know, uh, all the core competency, and bridging them together. Supermap gives you the map of 
something that's repetitive um, in less than three minutes, which might otherwise take you between five and 30. It's also consistent, it's less skill dependent, and you'll get fewer artifacts because we don't require uh, having to touch the tissue with an electrode. It's very adaptable and flexible in that it can track multiple types of rhythms all at once so that you can consistently create maps of repetitive rhythms, whether that's something simple like sinus rhythm or, or, or flutter or something very complex and constantly changing like the fibrillation. We can map all of it with three minutes of data or less. We had a previous circumferential ablation for the pulmonary veins and a CTI, a 70-year-old, and he presented in kind of a corset fib. We had also had a dual chamber pacemaker implanted for six sinus syndrome previously. Actually, the pacemaker had shown that he'd been in AFib for more than a month and a half now, with the original diagnosis made about two years ago. So he had progressed from kind of paroxysmal to persistent, tried a number of different antiarrhythmic drugs. So we were going to give him an option, another option of repeat ablation. Um, especially with the possibility of ablating some other uh, areas we hadn't ablated before. And uh, I tend to do two, two procedures on people, and then if there's no hope for a third one, we send them off to our surgeons for an epicardial maze operation. But uh, in any case, we, we agreed to do this guy with this system, and we used it as a standalone system. We used the Acumap catheter to connect, collect and generate the mapping information. I have always used a bus and variable loop lasso to confirm PV isolation. Some people use different things. And then uh, again, because we're constrained with that, we use the tactic ablation catheter for the actual therapeutic uh, application ablation. And Enzo just had to make my comments at any time. Go ahead. Next slide. Yeah, this is it, I think. So we did so we did the super map. This is the super map. So basically you just take this this basket catheter now and then you move it around. Rather than keeping it in the central location, you move it around, and as you see the little um, bubbles light up there on the screen from the basket, um, you are collecting data closer to the wall, not in contact, but closer to the wall, still using the dipole voltage method, until you get to about 60 or 70% of the volume of the, the atrium or the surface of the atrium mapped, and then um, you can uh, generate then the so-called super map after that. I'll show the next slide then. Yeah, so here's, <clears throat> I think Enzo, you had a few points to make about this. Uh, next yeah, so once once we um, adequately sample the left atrium in, in our uh, super map recording mode, uh, we end up to this screen. So this is essentially our super map setup screen. And um, during collection, the algorithm is able to bin uh, different rhythms based on CS morphology. So the binning occurs to, to the right of the map. You can see um, there's one beat group that has a 50% uh, of the collected beats and then so on and so forth. Um, so obviously we're interested in this, uh, in, in the patient's native rhythm and uh, we just ignored any of the ectopics that we collected, which were the other beat groups. Um, so once we finish uh, setting up our, our super map, then we'll go ahead and, and process it. And that is what happens here. So this is the, um, the super map of a single beat, a single beat um, basically stitched over and over after you're roving. And, and we see the activation um, kind of coming in on the... Uh, the anterior septal region and, and a little bit of a complex propagation through the septum. But on the posterior wall, everything looks pretty clean. Yeah, so this map, um, in conjunction with what we saw during AFib, got me a little bit concerned about that anterior area, maybe being something of more importance than we had originally thought. Um, but that's, uh, so that's what we showed. And then, I, this, do you have the next slide? Yeah, so then this, um, was done also the voltage map and lo and behold showed scarring around the right circle in the anterior wall and near this uh, area of interest. And we think that maybe in fact the wave fronts were propagating between these scars through this area. Now, having seen that in conjunction with the other uh, information I saw during the AFib, I probably in retrospect would have ablated this now. I probably wish we had, but um, it all seemed to correlate. And I think that uh, made us realize that we might want to 
I'm at the AFib, cardiovascular patients complete the PVI and then do this super map while we're in sinus rhythm, and it could be processed online at the time, and then take a look at the two if we have uh, concerns about an area that they've suggested we should abide from the map and see if they correlate. So this um, peak amplitude is something I think we need to work out more of the details of. That was very interesting. Okay, next slide. So um, let me move my little uh, vision view of everybody here so I can see better. So again, the procedure results were um, we DC carded the patient va- uh, after the lesion set to analyze the sinus rhythm. Um, and um, the supermap calculation is really helpful, I think, in retrospect of identifying an area that we noticed during AFib that was probably of importance. So I think the key takeaways are that uh, we kind of redefined our AF workflow further from, from this particular case. Uh, the supermap recordings actually didn't take much time. And um, you could, you can, with the, I think the use of all, all the tools available then are something we should definitely recommend that people do to our customers to help them decide the best there for their patients. And so our workflow is currently, if an AF do a central position map, cardiovert the patient, do a substrate protocol in the super map, correlate the amplitudes and the uh, maps obtained, and then uh, make a decision about the ablation targets. And then again, we could always remap if, uh, if you want after the ablations to confirm that the lesion set was effective. All right, what a great overview right there. Um, I encourage everyone who's listening to go ahead and please ask your questions in the chat room. Um, We do have some great physicians on the line here that are more than willing to answer your questions. Um, Dr. Betts, if you would not mind, can you share a little bit about your experience and how Acumap has changed your workflow when treating persistent atrial fibrillation patients? Yeah, certainly. So, we first started using the system back at the beginning of 2016. And, uh, you know, at that time it was very much uh, an atrial fibrillation treatment system, persistent AFib, and we did some clinical cases to get used to it and then started with the uncover registry. Um, and at that time, you know, in my own mind, I was trying to work out whether this is something to use at the, the very first time someone comes into the lab, or is it only for redos or for redo, redo, redos. Um, and actually, uh, as I've learned to use the system and it's become, uh, we've become slicker, the system itself has advanced. I, I personally believe it shortens procedure time. Um, so I'm prepared to use it almost as my go-to workhorse, certainly if I'm, I'm gonna do more than PVI. Um, with the advent of Supermap, I now would like to use it as my mapping system of choice for all uh, atypical flutters. So if something looks like a common right atrial flutter, we still go for the conventional approach, but certainly um, post-PVI, post-cardiac surgery, left atrial surgery, atypical flutters and multiple arrhythmias, we now have a mapping system which is gonna be able to map lots of different arrhythmias very quickly, non-sustained arrhythmias. Prior to the version two of the super map, if you got a regular atrial arrhythmia during your AFib ablation, there were a few limitations with the initial version, um, especially if it was two to one, but that has been fantastically superseded by the, as you've seen in the cases so far. So to, so that's my sort of overall view. And, and I think having something different available for these challenging AFib patients means that I now get referrals uh, from all around the UK for patients who've undergone AFib ablation two, three times in other centers. I mean, if you've had someone who's still got atrial fibrillation after two or three ablations, what are you going to offer them which you haven't tried already with a conventional system? What you need is something which is going to map atrial fibrillation and give you a, you know, give you an edge, uh, give you something which can hopefully be successful this time around. So that's, so, so now it's definitely in, increased my referral base it does mean I get the most challenging cases, but also it doesn't mean they're the longest cases because the workflow with the system itself is very rapid. As you've seen, doing a map is quick. Analyzing the map is as long as you want to take 
to analyze it or repeat an analysis. And then the rest is just the ablation. Um, so, uh, and otherwise it's very similar to doing a conventional AFib ablation, um, uh, you know, transeptal access, changing over the sheath. Uh, and really the take home message is map and map again and map again. I appreciate you sharing your insights with us. And it's great to hear that your referral base is increasing quite a bit by having um, all these centers sending their patients to you. As you know, being a frequent user of our system, we have all three mo mapping modalities, so all contact mapping, our single position, along with our super map. And I mentioned just right there that, you know, you've been using our system as your main workhorse and super map has played a big role in your practice. What is your what is the best feature from Supermap that you identify with? Well, it's 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 the speed. I mean, uh, I think uh, by far and away, uh, it's how fast it is. Uh, and sometimes a, a, a rhythm organizes, AFib organizes. It looks the the pattern looks like something common, mitral flutter. You can do some entrainment. It all fits you can get on and do some ablation, but that's only a proportion of the time. Uh, you can get all sorts of unusual arrhythmias, unusual circuits. Uh, you can switch from one to another. Um, you can get non-sustained arrhythmias, which all of this conventional mapping doesn't work. You can try high density mapping. And we've seen you know, the Pentaray for a long time, the HD grid. Uh, you can get some very detailed map with the, maps with these, but they take time. You know, 15, 20, 30 minutes to do a very complicated, detailed map. And then you still have to interpret it and understand it. With Supermap, you get all of that in three minutes. And I think the resolution is at least as good, if not better. I would like to see head-to-head -head comparison. And in the uh, presentations you, uh, you did a couple of hours ago, there was, a, I think, a, a hint that um, some groups are beginning to do this. We are in my institution as well. Um, just from an academic perspective, if we organize into a regular tachycardia during an AFib ablation, we'll do a super map. Before I know, then know the answer, I will then do a high density contact map using the ablation catheter or a circular catheter or an HD grid. And I'll do that to my satisfaction. And we're going to wait and see what the comparison is in the time, uh, as well as what we believe to be the accuracy, which I guess will be determined by where you do your burns and what happens to the arrhythmia. But for me, the number one uh, advantage it offers is speed. You know, time is of the essence. We know procedure wait times are long. Patients need to be getting in and out of the lab for these procedures. So. You know, we understand that here at Acutus, and we're lucky to be able to offer um, a mapping system that can map these arrhythmias in less than three minutes. Um, as I'm monitoring the chat room here, I do see we have another question. Um, it states, so you're going to determine regular rhythms using ECG to see supermap will be used. Can you determine multiple regular rhythms from ECG signals alone? Uh, so I would, um, I mean, the ECG, the pre-procedure ECG is always useful. Um, to be honest, it probably has more of a role if you're not using Acutus, because if you've got the AccuMap system, you can switch from AFib mapping, if it turns out to be AFib, or you can switch over to SuperMap if it's organized and regular. You've got, you can do both. If you thought someone was in a for want of a better term, coarse fib or flutter. You thought it might be an organized tachycardia. We've all seen it. Sometimes you go in there, you've got your 3D mapping patches on, you put the coronary sinus catheter in. It's not regular. It's not organized. It's just very coarse AF. Well, what are you going to do then with your conventional mapping system? You're going to have to empirically decide whether you're going to do some substrate modification, a line here or there. Sorry. With the AccuMap, you just switch to deciding to do AFib mapping and looking at the AFib substrate and the characteristics of that. And if it happens to organize then, you can switch over to Supermap. So the ECG is important, um, but uh, it wouldn't necessarily influence me as to what mapping system I, I, I chose to use. 
Um, right now, we'll go ahead and move forward to the next portion, the final portion of this session, where we'll introduce and take a closer look at our family of transeptal access products. This is the only true all-in-one transeptal system approved for use mechanically and with RF energy to puncture the septum. Dr. Anio Brenio, electrophysiologist from Greenville, South Carolina, will walk us through his experience with our No Stress Access Transeptal product line. Let's take a listen. Hey, my name is Andy Brenio. I'm an electrophysiologist. I've been practicing for over seven years now, and I've been with Greenville Health Systems for all seven of them. Uh, and I'd like to take an opportunity to talk with you about the Acuitas Transeptal Access Line, what you look for as a physician for transeptal access is safety, reproducibility, and beyond that, the ability to utilize it in situations where things are not as straightforward as they are most of the time. So one of the things I've been using the, um, the Acutus Transeptal line um, and the AccuCross Mini for probably almost six months. And I've had a lot of experience with it, both in EP as well as in the structural heart procedure space. It, is a product that is very easy to use. It's one of the things that came out to me right from the get-go is it's very user-friendly and it allows a very safe and predictable crossing performance. The idea here is one of the greatest points of risk in the procedures we do where it can cause a derailment and an end of a procedure and a complication is the transeptal puncture. So the extendable retractable needle allows you to place the sheath where you want to cross, extend the needle beyond, and then dependent upon whether or not you want to utilize radio frequency to generate a larger um, transeptal access point, you can. It, it gives you the opportunity to do that. And I've had a lot of success doing it both ways, both with radio frequency as well as without. The, um, in addition to both the performance of the product, which is very reliable, consistent, and again, the, the ease of use is something that will really strike you as soon as you get the opportunity to use it. It also has allowed me to reduce the overall cost footprint, cost per case for both our structural heart procedures as well as our EP procedures. And this is something that has not gone unnoticed by our administrators, and they've been very appreciative of the ability for us to minimize the use of additional disposables to still achieve the exact same safe transeptal, a successful procedure, but at a lower cost than what would generally be considered through either multiple sheets and RF needles, et cetera. Getting back to the the ease of use and the workflow of the transeptal. The ability to extend the 18 gauge needle, 
enter into the left atrium and immediately advance the wire, which is seated inside the dilator into the left atrium. Whereas before with other transeptal workflows, it requires exchanges into and out of the left atrium, which is something that is almost certainly safe, but it's something that I like to avoid. It, it cuts a step out of the procedure as well as it cuts any potential air introduction into the left atrium through minimizing such an exchange. The ability for me to utilize the disposable, the transeptal AccuCross has allowed me to improve the efficiency of my procedures by both, again, making transeptal pretty easy, as well as cutting out additional steps of exchanges and prepping new things, opening additional products. I've had a number of procedures where things have not been straightforward, and I've noticed again that the, the sheath and the, the whole transeptal line performs very well, even in situations where I'm dealing with complex anatomy, corrected tetralogy, dextrocardia. These are situations that I've encountered. And plus, when you begin to get into the structural heart space, you're working with a desire to perform transeptal puncture in a specific location on the interatrial septum. And this product has performed very well when I wanted to either generate an anterior stick or a posterior and inferior stick, depending upon what we're doing. So that's something that is, it's easy for most products to be able to just drop onto the interatrial septum and tent and cross. I think that would be the base expectation, but the ability to utilize it when things are not straightforward or when you're fighting to try to find the appropriate spot to cross in an effort to maximize the physics of placement of some sort of structural heart procedure, some, sort of, some structural heart device, that's where things get tricky and that's where a product either is going to help you or it, you're really going to become frustrated. And my experience has been that this product has helped me achieve the things that I need to achieve, even when it's not something that is just a you know, very easy, thin interatrial septum that is not going to be difficult to cross independent of your skill set or whatever tools you're using. In circumstances where I've encountered thicker septums, the ability to utilize uh, radio frequency energy has come in handy. And I, I, coupling that with the fact that the, um, the device resulted in us achieving significant cost savings, this was, a, this was a pretty solid win for me, both on the procedural efficiency side, as well as you know, just the, the ability to get procedures that are not straightforward all the time done successfully in a consistent fashion. And this is the kind of product that will allow me to not spend capital dollars on some sort of RF generator or something else allowing me to utilize those dollars hopefully somewhere else where it's more important for me. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenio, for, um, for that nice overview. Um, I believe you're joining us today as well. Um, if you wouldn't, hi, it's nice to see you. Um, if Likewise. you wouldn't mind talking to us a little bit about when, when one of our sales reps initially brought you this product, what was your first impression? What was your first thought when you had it in your hands? You know, or did you think, wow, this is an all-in-one, it retains the guide wire? I mean, what were, what were the things that came into your head that made you want to utilize the system? The keys are ease of use, user-friendly, and, you know, kind of minimizing complexity when it comes to something that can derail an ablation procedure. You go from doing an AFib ablation to doing a pericardiocentesis if you if you have a bad transeptal. Uh, and this was one where pretty quickly it became clear that it is very easy to utilize. Everything is uh, all together in one, and it was something that you don't have to open extra packaging. It's very 
user friendly and straightforward. So my first impression was just the kind of very not not basic, but very simple, effective strategy that this employed. And you almost look at it when you put it in your hands and you're kind of like, why didn't I think of this? I mean, it it is a very uh, easy product to utilize and it's reproducible with regard to its ease of use. At first, when I was getting started, I didn't utilize radio frequency energy. So it was very much like crossing with a BRK and it performed very well. And then eventually, once I became comfortable with the base function of the device, which took only a few cases, we began to, when we were doing something like left atrial appendage closure or utilizing larger um, left atrial sheets, we began to utilize radio frequency energy and it performed even better once we took that step. So my first impressions were just ease of use very simple design it, it, it it's elegant in terms of how simple that it is okay great thank you for that feedback and i understand i mean you've been using our device for some quite quite some time um and you introduced this to your partners and as well uh, as well as some interventionalists who do some structural procedures is that correct yeah the interventional guys originally we as eps were responsible for working with them in terms of training on um, transeptal puncture technique and both for mitral clip as well as for left atrial appendage occlusion. And so initially we were utilizing RF needles and then we transitioned to utilizing this almost exclusively, exclusively for our structural heart procedures. So they, in terms of learning from scratch, it, it was very easy for someone to pick up and use. This is the kind of thing where if I was in a training center, if I had fellows, I would be very comfortable teaching them how to use this because it's, it's about as straightforward a transeptal puncture as you could achieve. Um, and depending upon what you want to use, it, it comes with its own wire. You can utilize a, um, a stiffer wire. Um, you can utilize a, a tore or a curled wire if you want. Um, all of these things are, you, you can begin to customize it as much as you want to. I don't necessarily, I use what is in the kit. The wires are very effective and all my procedures are done floorless. So everything is based on ice and everything, all my watchmans are either ice or TE. I don't really, I'm not a fan of fluoroscopy in general. So Everything I saw a question come by that you know was interested about how how easy they are to visualize on ice. Yeah, and it's the same as what you would see if you were utilizing a standard SL zero sheath or seeing them across the interatrial septum. Um, and if it was something where I couldn't see it on ice or I couldn't see it on TEE, I wouldn't I wouldn't be talking about it right now because that's what I do. That's the base platform of how I do all my ablation. So I, I find it to be very easy to see the sheath and also the needle itself. When you extend the needle, so you, you have your ice view uh, or your TEE view of the interatrial septum. And as you extend the needle, you can easily see how echogenic it is located on, on the interatrial septum where you've actually crossed. So being able to see the needle helps as you're doing the puncture itself, but everything is easy to see on ice or TEE. Great, thank you for answering that question. I was just about to bring that up, so I'm glad you caught that. Um, and I'm glad that you've been having such great experience with the system. Um, we definitely um, are proud of these devices and are happy that they're allowing things to be safer, they're cost-effective, and um, they're expediting procedural uh, efficiencies in the lab as well. Not to mention, though we are specifically an EP-focused company, um, the yeah. more that we can help our colleagues within the cardiology space, such as our interventionalists, we are more than happy uh, to, to do that. Um, so thank one you. Of the, and yeah. One of the things that when I'm either taught ablation or taught transeptal access, one of the concerns that physicians have had if I've used an RF needle is 
removal of the RF needle, introduction of sheath exchanges across the interatrial septum, people do not like. And this product allows you to avoid doing that altogether, given the fact that as you position the needle on the septum, you already have the wire inside the dilator. So there's no need for an exchange. Everything is where it needs to be. And that was one of the positives that came out pretty quickly in terms of a reduction in a procedural step, but also the potential for thrombus or air or anything like that is um, it, it a minimum intuitively reduced. So that was one of the other things I, I, I liked about it early on. Great, great. Thank you for that, for that feedback. It's important that we have and we create products that physicians are gonna utilize, that they see procedural benefits to, um, and that are safe and effective. So um, we're I just want to thank Dr. Brenio, Dr. Betts, and Dr. Beatty for joining us today. This was a very informative session that walked through a couple case studies that highlighted the value of our CUTIS portfolio. We were taught how the AccuMap can help change and improve procedural workflow. And lastly, we learned about our transeptal access product family, which addresses what matters most to physicians, procedural efficiencies, safety, and the opportunity for significant cost savings. Thank you to all our viewers who tuned in today for this first session. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day. If, you were, if we were unable to answer your questions or if you have additional questions, please let us know. We hope to see you later today at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time for a happy hour where we continue to celebrate electrophysiologists. Though we're unable to reunite and reminisce at HRS this year, we can try to bring this virtual happy hour to you. Once again, it has been an absolute pleasure being your host for today, and I wish you all the best.